uh, a graduate of Sin Medical College, batch 1988. It's, great, it's with great pleasure to give lecture to my college fellow. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for SMC. I'm going to talk about pulmonary embolism and will briefly touch on deep vein thrombosis as both are the part of the same disease known as venous thromboembolic disease. In order to a clot to be formed in the deep venous system, there has to be three things. Venous stasis, damage to vascular endothelium that exposes to highly thrombogenic subendothelial connective tissue and hypercoagulable state. There are several hypercoagulable states. Some of them are hereditary, some of them are acquired, such as protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, activated protein C resistance, ligand factor, anti-thrombin third deficiency, prothrombin mutation, lupus anticoagulant, antiphospholipid, and so on. And some cancer also leads to, not some, most of them leads to increased um, coagulable state, most important one are the lung cancer, pancreatic cancers, ovary, ovarian and brain cancer. Oral contraceptive, especially in the first six months of therapy, especially one that has estrogen. Damage to vascular endothelium can result from trauma, vasculitis, bacterial toxin, et cetera, that exposes subendothelial connective tissue, which is thrombogenic. Clinical conditions, those are associated with increased risk of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms include obesity, age more than 40, major surgery involving abdomen, pelvis, lower extremities, fractures, high estrogen state, stroke, inflammatory bowel disease, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, etc. Most of the clot forms in the lower extremity deep in a system. Lower extremity deep in a system is divided into two, proximal and the distal. Proximal deep venous system consists of common femoral vein, superficial femoral vein, deep femoral vein, and pop lateral vein. Distal anterior, distal deep venous system consists of anterior tibial vein, posterior tibial vein, peroneal vein, and soleal vein. Most of the clots, I'm gonna hold on for a while here to stop this background sound. Hey, hey, hey guys, can you be quiet for recording? So most of the clot forms in the deep venous system of lower extremities. Deep venous system of lower extremities is divided into proximal and the distal. Proximal deep venous systems include common femoral vein, superficial femoral vein, deep femoral, uh, femoral vein, pop lateral vein, and the distal ones involve anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and soleal veins. Most of the clots form in the soleal vein and majority of them gets resolved on its own and only 30% will propagate and involve the popliteal vein where it can break off and produce venous thrombosis. Deep venous systems of the upper extremities consist of internal jugular veins, subclavian vein and axillary vein. Now, 79% of patients who present with pulmonary embolism will have concomitant DVT, and 50% of patients with deep venous thrombosis will have pulmonary embolism as well. 300,000 people die in the United States each year of acute pulmonary embolism. Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, like any other disease, depends upon the history, physical examination, pretest, and probability, and diagnostic test. History of pulmonary embolism varies from person to person because it depends on the pre-existing cardiopulmonary status and the clot burden. If a person who has normal lung and uh, normal cardiac function may be as relatively asymptomatic with a smaller PE, while a person who has impaired cardiovascular system 
can have a lot of symptoms may develop a lot of symptoms. So symptoms include shortness of breath, which is the most common, and shortness of breath will be sudden onset, maybe a couple of hours in duration, maybe a day or two, but it's not gonna be like present for days or weeks. Patient may present with chest pain. If he has pulmonary embolism, he will complain of fluidic chest pain. If the patient has increased clot burden, he may present with uh, pain like an angina because of ischemia involving right ventricle. Patient may present with hemoptysis again in case of pulmonary infarction. If the clot burden is large enough where it can transiently obstruct your right ventricle output, you patient may present with syncopal episode. There may be cough. Most of the time the cough is going to be dry. Now on physical examination, what you're gonna find on the vitals, you will have increased heart rate, generally is more than 100, respiratory rate gonna be increased, blood pressure may be normal, may be low, depending upon the clot burden. On chest auscultation, one will hear localized wheezing, pleural rub, and rolls. On cardiac examination, there may be S3 gallop or increased PO2. On extremities examination, one can find the sign of deep venous thrombosis, such as calf swelling, dilated veins, calf tenderness, or hormone signs. How to make the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism? The first step is to determine your pretest probability. Is it high, intermediate, or low? There are three validated scoring systems to calculate pretest probability, and those include Wells criteria, revised Geneva scoring system, simplifies revised Geneva scoring system. The most commonly that we use in this country is the Wells criteria. It has seven variables, two with the three point, and uh, three with 1.5 points, and two with one points. Sign and symptoms of DVT in lower extremity or upper extremity, that's your three points. If pulmonary embolism can explain the diagnosis better than the alternative diagnosis you have, although I have to say this varies from person to person, how you think, Heart rate, 100 or more, 1.5 point. Immobilization or surgery in the past four weeks, 1.5 point. Previous DVT or PE, 1.5 point. Hemoptysis is 1 point, 1 point, and cancer is 1 point, specially diagnosed in the past six months. Now, based on this score system, you can divide your pretest probability into intermediate, low, or high. Simply, you can say four points or low is intermediate and low probability, and more than four is a high probability. This is the most important step in the diagnosis of PE, to avoid unnecessary test. So once you have decided that the patient has low pretest probability or intermediate probability, then you have to do next test, which is known as D-dimer test. D-dimer test, if it's being done by ELISA method is highly sensitive test. It has a sensitivity of 98% and is used for rule out PE criteria. It is not used to diagnose because it has high negative predictive value. It is a wonderful test for outpatient, but is a useless test when you use in-house patient because it can be positive in so many conditions such as pneumonia, vasculitis, MI, pregnancy, cancer, you name it. And also the diameter level when you are interpreting, you have to do according to the age. For example, if your lab has a abnormal cutoff value of 400, that means below 400 is negative, above 400 is positive, then in patient, at the age of 50 or above, you have to multiply that number by 10 in order for the test to be considered positive. For example, let's say your lab value is 500, which is abnormal, but patient is 60 years old. For him, 10 times 60, 600 would be abnormal. Similarly, patient who's 75 years of age, for him would be 750 would be abnormal. So once you have the D-dimer, you have checked the D-dimer, then you move further. So if the patient is 
in pa a patient who has low pretest probability, in those patients, you don't even have to do redimer. You can do what they call pulmonary embolism rule out criteria that was initially developed for emergency physicians. That means if you have all of these eight absent, then it's not going to be pulmonary embolism. For example, the patient is not more than 50 years of age, heart rate is not more than 100, oxygen saturation is not less than 95%, there is no history of prior v deep vein thrombosis of PE, there is no history of surgery in the past four weeks, no unilateral swelling on physical examination, no hemoptysis, and no history of use of oral contraceptive. If all of that is absent, and your pretest probability is low, then PE is almost ruled out. So now, if your pretest probability is intermediate, then you have to do the D-dimer. If your pretest probability is high, then you don't have to do D-dimer. You just proceed directly to the diagnostic test. So, what diagnostic test we use? Well, there are. CT pulmonary angiography, which is now considered to be almost gold standard, used to be pulmonary angiography. We don't use it anymore. Magnetic resonance angiography, it is not yet ready for clinical use. So two most important tests to diagnose pulmonary embolism include CT pulmonary angiography and ventilation perfusion scan. But the test of choice is CTA. But if the patient has acute renal failure or patient has severe contrast injury, of course you can do the CT and geography. It has to be done with contrast. So you will go to the ventilation perfusion scan. Let's do a question. Let's see a 26 year old male man complaining of acute onset of fluidic chest pain while he was doing strenuous exercise at gym, he comes in and complaining of slight shortness of breath. He does not have any history of deep vein thrombosis and he does not take any medication. He works as an art, uh, architect and local firm. There is no history of travel. He has no family history of PE or DVT. On physical examination, he appears slightly anxious. His afibril, his room air saturation is more than 95%. His chest is clear to auscultation and the rest of the physical exam is unremarkable. Do the chest x-ray, that's normal. You do the basic labs. EKG shows normal sinus rhythm, heart rate is less than 100. So question is, which of the following is the best next step in this patient's management? Obtain a CTA of chest to rule out pulmonary embolism. Obtain an exercise stress test. Obtain a ventilation perfusion scan. And the last option is give the patient non-steroidal and kind inflammatory and arrange for a follow-up visit the following weeks. Write it down your question. I, make, I will get back to this at the end of this lecture. Okay, so you do the CTA of the chest and that's what it's gonna show if the patient has pulmonary embolism. As you can see the A picture, there is a clot in the left vein pulmonary artery and its upper branch and there is a small clot on the right as well. Here is the picture on the one that uh, on the right side, there is thrombus in the right main pulmonary artery. On the plain film of the chest, where the arrow indicates there is decreased vascularity distal to pulmonary embolism. That is known as Westermark sign. If there is a wedge-shaped infiltrate on the chest x-ray or CAT scan, that is known as, that result from pulmonary infarction and known as Hampton sign. It's a patient of mine who presented with syncopal episode, episode after a long haul flight. And you can see there is pretty extensive thrombus in both pulmonary arteries. And the same patient showing uh, saddle embolism clot extension to both main pulmonary arteries and there is also the clot sitting uh, in the right lower branch. Patient, this CT scan showing uh, small right-sided pleural fusions and infiltrate bilaterally and the base of the infiltrate is pleural based and that infiltrate represents 
bilateral pulmonary infarction known as Hampton sign. Another CTA showing a small effusion with saddle embolism. Once you have made the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, next step comes the risk of stratification. So you can decide where are you going to admit this patient? Are you going to admit this patient in intensive care unit based on the uh, risk of PE related complication in the first 30 days as compared to a patient admitting on the step down unit or can you discharge this patient from the emergency department on oral anticoagulant? So the risk of stratification depends on RV, presence or absence of RV dysfunction, elevation of biomarker, those include troponin and BNP, and pulmonary embolism severity index. Now, echocardiogram, as you can see uh, in picture A, it's a four view chambers. Normally, right ventricle should be much smaller than the left ventricle. Here in this picture, you can see the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle. So the ratio of RV to LV is more than one. So that indicates the presence of RV dysfunction. Other signs of acute massive PE on echocardiogram will be paradoxical movement of uh, ventricular, interventricular septum and also D sign on left parasternal short axis. Now you can see that RV dysfunction on the CTA, uh, on the B picture, you can see the size of the right ventricle as compared to the left ventricle is a lot. So the RV to LV ratio is more than one. Biomarkers are troponin BNP. Whenever there's an increased quad burden, that will lead to sudden increase in right intraventricle pressure, and that will lead to leak of troponin and, and rise in uh, BNP level. Now, pulmonary severity index, it has 11 uh, parameters. I know it's very hard to memorize all those 11 of them, but one can memorize only four of them, which is simplified pulmonary severity index. And it has only congestive heart failure, CHF cancer, heart rate 110 more is one point, and blood pressure systolic less than is 100 is one point. If all of them are absent, pulmonary severity index is zero, the 30, early 30 days mortality is 1%. So for risk of stratification, again, there are lots of validated uh, scoring systems. The common one is the BOA system, which divides into stage one, two, and three. And it has four parameters, systolic blood pressure, 190 is two, cardiac troponin elevation two, RV dysfunction two, and heart rate more 110 or more, or, or more is two. So if the two points are present, it's stage one, that means low risk. For early uh, PE-related complication, the first three days, is stage two is between two and four. Stage four is, or more is, uh, more than four is stage three, that means high risk of early pulmonary embolism-related complications, which is about 10%. Stage one is about 3%, and stage two is about 6%. Of course, uh, besides ordering um, a specific test to diagnose pulmonary embolism, you probably you're gonna do the basic test such as EKG. And the EKG finding of pulmonary embolism, if the most common is only sinus tachycardia, nothing else. But the classic finding, which is seen only in 20% of cases is S1, Q3, T3 pattern. What does that mean? Mean that you have an S wave in limb lead one Q wave in lead, limb lead three and T wave inversion in limb lead three. If the patient has large enough clot that can produce right ventricular strain, then you will see the right ventricular strain pattern on EKG that will be indicated by T wave inversion in right sided chest leads V1, V2, 3, and 4. Uh, if the clot is bigger than that, it may produce incomplete or complete right bundle branch black. You may have new onset, atrial fibrillation, or atrial flutter. This is the EKG showing a um, classic pattern of S1, Q3, T3 pattern. You can see the Q wave in limb lead one, and uh, sorry, S wave in limb lead one, Q wave, and T wave inversion in limb lead three. 
and there is T-wave inversion and right-sided chest bleeds. Here's another EKG operation of mine, which is showing uh, S1 QCT3 pattern and right ventricular strain pattern, which is the inversion of T-wave and right-sided chest bleeds, V1 to V4. Treatment of pulmonary embolism. Well, treatment of pulmonary embolism depends upon hemodynamic instability, or is this patient is hemodynamically instable, inst unstable or stable? So anti, and that's how you're gonna decide if you are going to use anticoagulant or thrombolytic therapy known as reperfusion therapy and timing of the first dose of anticoagulant. When are you going to give the first dose? Are you gonna wait for the CTA result to come back or you will go ahead and give it? Well, if the person is hemodynamically stable, then you will start patient on anticoagulant. Anticoagulants, they are parenteral and oral. Parenteral one includes low molecular weight heparin, fondaparinex, unfractionated heparin, and drug thrombin inhibitor, which you normally don't use unless there is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And oral anticoagulants are vitamin K antagonist, humidin, which by the way, we don't use anymore. It has been replaced by direct oral anticoagulant, those are two, there are two broad groups, thrombin inhibitor, which is dabigatrin, and factor 10A inhibitor. There are several of them, but the common ones are rivaroxaban, apexaban, and adoxaban. So once you decide that you're gonna start patient on or, uh, anticoagulant, that means the patient is hemodynamically stable and depending upon this patient is high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk. If the patient is high risk, that means patient has RV dysfunction. On the CT scan or echocardiogram, patient has increased troponin level, and the patient's pulmonary embolism severity index is high. So that patient should go to intensive care unit because these patients can decompensate and may require thrombolytic therapy within the next 48 hours. So these patients should be started on low molecular weight heparin, which is easy because you do not have to do PT-PTT, just a start a dose, one mg per kg sub QBID, and continue for four to five days, and after that, switch it to oral direct anticoagulant, either rivaroxaban or apexaban. If the patient is in immediate risk, that patient can go to the step down unit, and that patient should also be started on normal molecular weight heparin. And for two to three days, then switch it to PO, apexaban, and rivaroxaban. The thing to remember that if you start rivaroxaban or apexaban, they can be started without low molecular weight heparin in low risk patient. So, the patient with low risk whose pulmonary embolism severity, uh, simplified pulmonary embolism severity index is only zero, doesn't have right, right ventricular dysfunction, doesn't have increased troponin level, this patient can be discharged from the emergency room, provided he's reliable, he cannot take his medication, and put him on rivaroxaban or apexaban, but not cumodin, because cumodin is gonna take several days to kick in. So once the patient has started anticoagulation for pulmonary embolism, then the question is, how long is this patient gonna be on anticoagulation? So these slides are taken from 2013 American College of Chest Physician Guidelines for pulmonary embolism and deep, and deep vein thrombosis, management and diagnosis. So if the patient has provoked pulmonary embolism. That means the pulmonary embolism developed following surgery or long travel. So that should be treated for three months. If the patient uh, has unprovoked, that means without any obvious reason, patient developed pulmonary embolism, then that should be treated indefinitely. Should be treated at least for three to six months. And at the end of six months or three months, patient should be evaluated to see what's the risk of continuation of an acquagulation versus a stopping. If it's a low risk of bleeding, then continue your uh, anticoagulation. What happens if the patient uh, has a second episode of unprovoked 
P, uh, PE or DVP. Well, these patients definitely gonna be on anticoagulation for the rest of their life. What about the patient with DVT or PE with active cancer? Well, according to American College of Chest Physicians, it's a weak recommendation, but the recommendation is that these patients should be treated with low molecular weight heparin rather than uh, oral anticoagulant, uh, especially the Coumadin. But lately, there has been a study in New England Journal where they compare direct oral anticoagulant, atoxab atoxaban, with low molecular weight heparin uh, for the prevention of recurrence of PE. And they found that atoxaban is non-inferior to low molecular weight heparin. That means now we can use uh, atoxaban PO for, to prevent recurrence of pulmonary embolism in patients who have cancer. Well, what about the duration of anticoagulation in patients who have history of thrombophilia? Well, there is no data suggesting that patients with VTE and thrombophilia should be treated any differently than patients with VTE and no, thrombo, uh, no thrombophilia. There is no difference between the intensity and the duration. If the patient has provoked VTE, then whether he has thrombophilia or not, he should be treated for three months. And of course, unprovoked and in both cases going to be treated indefinitely depending upon the risk of bleeding. Now, the question always comes, when to order this uh, test for, to check for thrombophilia? Well, it is reasonable to order this test if patient develops unprovoked PE or DVT under the age of 40. If patient develop recurrent DVT or PE unprovoked, or in first degree relative of patients who has unprovoked PE or DVT under the age of 40. How about if the patient develop pulmonary embolism while on treatment, either with uh, Coumadin or direct oral anticoagulant, what to do with those patients? Well, according to American College of Chest Physician guideline updated in 2016, if the patient develops recurrent VTE while on therapy dose of non-low non molecular weight anticoagulant, that means either direct oral anticoagulant or Coumadin, then they need to be switched to low molecular weight heparin until you figure out what's going on with this patient. And if the patient develops recurrent VTE while on low molecular weight heparin, then just increase the dose of low molecular weight heparin by one third or one fourth. Okay, let's see now the you have a patient, you are suspecting pulmonary embolism and the uh, patient is too unstable and that is defined as systolic blood pressure less than 90 or drop in more than 40, although it's more than 90, but it will drop more than 40 from its baseline and stays there for 15 minutes. And there is no other obvious reason for hypotension, such as sepsis, hypovolemia, onset of neurythmia, et cetera then these patients should be given thrombolytic therapy or reperfusion therapy. Although most of the time this should be given once you have confirmed the diagnosis of PE, but sometimes you may not have the time. I had a patient came in with pain in his knee and he has a knee surgery. Uh, no, I think he has a uh, uh, degenerative joint disease and on examination he has swelling, but before we could do anything, he crashed in front of me and had to be intubated. There was no time, he became hypotensive. So in that case, luckily I had a pocket ultrasound, did the best side, alt, ultrasound of his heart, so right ventricle is dilated. That's massive PE. We give him a thrombolytic therapy, within the next two hours, his blood pressure came up, oxygenation came up, and then we did the CTA later on and found this residual clot. So, what I'm saying that if the patient is too unstable where you can do the CTA to confirm the diagnosis, then do the bedside ultrasound. If you see the right ventricular dysfunction, that's what it is. Then start patient on thrombolytic therapy. Now, normally we use TPA, 100 milligram given over two hours. 
Of course, there has to be no contraindication to its use. It causes major bleeding in up to 9%, but the risk of intracranial bleed is about less than 1%. And it needs to be given preferably through the systemic vein rather than given directly into the pulmonary artery. How about uh, if the patient has contraindication to thrombolytic therapy and is hemodynamically unstable? Well, then you have to use catheter-based thrombus removal technique. The indication for that is, number one, if patient has a major contraindication to thrombolytic therapy and is hypotensive and has uh, PE, or if the patient has failed to respond to your TPA, you have given the TPA and he's still uh, unstable and the clot didn't resolve completely. And number third is if shock likely to cause that before the systemic thrombolytic can take effect, because you know it's gonna take two hours for TPA to be effective. So in those situations, you do a catheter-based thrombus removal, you pass a catheter to the major vein, either subclavian, internal jugular, or femoral vein, and once the catheter in the pulmonary artery, then you break the pulmonary embolism by mechanical uh, fragmentation and then suck it out. What about if you do not have expertise to do catheter-based removal of pulmonary embolism and patient is hypotensive and he has contraindication to thrombolytic therapy, it's a dire situation. Then you gotta take it directly to the OR, have to have a thoracic surgeon available who has to go in and physically remove the clot from the pulmonary artery. Well, this is a schematic um, presentation which I have taken from um, European Society of Cardiology 2019 uh, guidelines for the diagnosis and management of pulmonary embolism. So what I just tell that patient with, suspicion of patient with uh, PE, first thing to do is, especially if it's high risk or intermediate risk, then give the anticoagulant. That means, what does that mean? Let's see if the patient has high clinical probability. You don't have to do dimer. Or intermediate probability, you have done the D-dimer, it's positive, and you ordered a CTA. Well, it depends at your institution how long it's gonna take for CTA to be done and for you to receive the result. Or maybe if you are a resident in the middle of the night and uh, you suspect PE and you have a high clinical uh, suspicion. And if there is no contraindication, go and give the one dose of low molecular weight heparin and let the patient go for CTA because you're covered for the next 12 hours. So according to this, if the patient is hemodynamically, has hemodynamic instability, then okay, the high risk, yes. Then bedside echo, positive, go and give the uh, thrombolytic therapy. If patient is not hemo, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, then you have to look for factor that indicates um, high risk or intermediate risk. That means RV presence of IV, RV dysfunction and increased troponin. If have both of them, that sees intermediate risk, then ICU again goes on troponin, but monitor him closely for the next 48 hours to make sure he doesn't develop hemodynamic collapse and may require thrombolytic therapy. So if it's a low risk, then can either be admitted to the hospitals on the general medical floor, or if it's very low risk and pulmonary severity index is simplified pulmonary embolism severity index is zero, he can be sent home on oral, direct oral and anticoagulant. How about the role of inferior vena caval filter? When do we put inferior vena caval filter or IVC filter? Well, one of the indication which is very clear cut is that if the patient has PE or DVT and he can't take anticoagulation because of active bleeding, then we need to put IVC filter. Another one is if the patient is on therapeutic dose of anticoagulant and develop recurrence of PE DVT, then you have to go and place the filter. Another one is sort of soft indication, which is called prophylaxis. Let's see patient has a PE, and you have to treat this patient for three months, but he was two months in the treatment and requires some 
emergent surgery, which cannot be postponed until the patient completed three months of anticoagulation. In such situation, of course, you're gonna stop anticoagulation, and now it increases the risk of recurrence, so you put the filter in for that interim period and let patient go for surgery, and after surgery, whenever it's feasible, you start with the background anticoagulant, and IBC filter then can be taken out in a couple of weeks, or maybe one or two weeks. Another indication is also sort of soft. Let's see patient has a massive pulmonary embolism, and um, you also did the Doppler study of lower extremity and found that patient has extensive blood clot in the lower extremity. Now, you know, this patient can't take any more clot. He's already got extensive clot in the lung. So in such situation, IVC filter can be placed temporarily. Uh, and uh, once the pulmonary embolism and DVT is treated, then it can be removed. Another, uh, this, so let's recap what we discussed so far. So you're suspecting PE and patient is hemodynamically um, unstable. You did a bad side echo. You found that the patient has RV dysfunction. That means it's most likely the PE. So, and go ahead, if you can do a CTA, send the patient a CTA. If it's too unstable, go ahead and give the thrombolytic. If your CTA is done, confirm, give the thrombolytic. But if this, you suspected PE, you did a bad side echo, there is no RV dysfunction. So that means this patient shock is not related to massive PE. So look for alternative diagnosis. Now, suspected P in patients who are hemodynamically stable. Well, you start with, again, as I said, first thing is what is your preclinical, clin uh, pre uh, clinical pretest probability? Well, it's lower and intermediate. The next step is D dimer, D dimer, D dimer. Okay, D dimer is negative. P is ruled out. If the D dimer is positive, then you go to next step, confirmation, and confirm that with CT pulmonary angiography. If the patient has high clinical pretest probability, you do not need D-dimer, go directly to the CTPA. If it's positive, treat it. If it's negative, PE is ruled out. What about the diagnosis and management of PE in pregnant women? It's more or less, diagnosis is same as in non-pregnant. First, you have to find out what is your pre-test probability is. If it is low, uh, check the D-dimer, it's negative, you stop. If it's intermediate, D-dimer, negative, stop. If it's positive or high pre-test probability, then go direct, now go to uh, either CTA or VQ scan. Both CTA and VQ scan gives relatively low and equivalent radiation to feeders. But in case of CTA, there is more radiation is given to maternal breast tissue that increases the risk of cancer down the road. Although new version of CT scans and new techniques have minimized this radiation considerably and the risk of breast cancer has gone, is minimal now. So let's say you're diagnosed or alternatively if patient uh, pregnant and uh, come with shortness of breath and has a leg swelling and you do the uh, Doppler study, which is positive with DVT, then of course it's gonna be PE that's causing it, then you can start treatment. Uh, so treatment is a little bit different as a non-pregnant because most of the medications are contraindicated in pregnancy or carries risk of uh, iatrogenic risk. So the drug of choice is low molecular weight heparin. So you have to use low molecular weight heparin and anticoagulation needs to be given three months plus six weeks of postpartum. The highest risk of DVT PE is in the postpartum period. So low molecular weight heparin should be given during the pregnancy and should be stopped 36 hours before the anticipated date of delivery and uh, switch with heparin and then heparin can be stopped four to six hours before anticipation of delivery and then after the delivery person can be restarted back on uh, anticoagulation either shortly with I means for a short period of time with heparin or low molecular with heparin although 
after delivery, you can stop, you can start oral anticoagulant. Now there's a couple of these things which you will not find the answer in the book, but this is just comes with experience. So question is, do we need to do Doppler study of lower extremity if we have already diagnosed a person with a pulmonary embolism? I normally don't do it because I ain't gonna change my management. I already got pulmonary embolism. I'm gonna treat for three months. Whether this patient has DVT or P, I don't care. First of all, it comes from the lower extremity anyhow. So normally I don't do it. So not, what about the other way around? Let's see, uh, patient came in with uh, leg swelling, you did the Doppler study and you found the patient has DVT. Do I need to do CTA on this patient to confirm if patient has PE because 50% might have PE? Again, if the patient is not complaining of shortness of breath, he's hemodynamically stable, who, who cares if he has a PE or DVT? You are going to treat him same way anyhow for three months. Yes, I can understand if this patient is hemodynamically unstable, that's gonna change your management because now you're gonna use the TPA rather than anticoagulant. Yeah, in those patients, it's reasonable to do CTHS and it, because they have hemodynamic instability. Other question is, when to repeat echocardiogram if initial echocardiogram showed elevated PA pressure in patient with acute PE? Well, in order to find out if this patient has developed chronic thromboembolic disease related pulmonary hypertension, which is known as WHO class four, then echocardiogram should be repeated three months of, of anticoagulation. After three months of anticoagulation following a PE. And if patient continues to have pulmonary hypertension, that means the clot did not resolve completely and uh, now has increased pulmonary vascular resistance and causing pulmonary hypertension. Let me give you some questions and um, go to your best. I know you guys are pretty smart. And uh, let me know what answer you have for these questions. So I'm not gonna read this question. These are there, you can read them and send me the email and I will reply to let you know if you got them right or no. So there are three questions. Thank you very much for your attention. For any feedback or any questions, do not hesitate. Please contact me at email wasim.wasim077 at gmail.com. Thank you very much and God bless you.